Hi, mate. How you doing? Not bad, mate. How are you? Good, mate. Sir. Good, so, good. First, first couple of minutes, we'll just get them all checked in. Yeah. So they're all online. I'll waffle on for a little bit. Okay. And we'll just get straight into it. If it gets towards the end and it's running on a little bit, then, you, then you'll need to shoot. Yeah. Get yourself away and that's fine. Yeah, fine, mate. No problems. Good stuff. Nah, I'm not start letting them in. Okay, good. How's everyone doing? Everyone fitting well? Yeah, I think I've got you all muted anyway tonight, so we'll not have anybody listening to everybody's conversations, which will be good. I'll just get a couple more minutes as usual, just to let everyone else get on. Okay, good. We'll make a start then. Few Sheffield United shirts on tonight, which is good to see. Freddie, you've let me down. <laughs> you went to stop on. Not got your Port Vale top on, Jake. No. Okay, good. So, slightly different tonight. So rather than just going down the, the goalkeeper route that we've been going down for the last few weeks and we will be doing for other weeks, I thought it might be important just to get a different view. Okay, so my relationship with Chris goes back many years from uh, when I was a, an apprentice at Sheffield United. Chris was an apprentice at Barnsley and we got very good friends. And it was actually through Chris that my actual move to Barnsley come through because he'd spoke to the coaches at Barnsley and uh, that's how we fixed up me moving there. And that's how I eventually moved to Barnsley and me and Chris become very good friends and we have been friends ever since. So this is what I keep saying to you about football. You get lots of friends in football that you can carry through all the way through your life. And then when you need a favour, like someone to come on and help you with one of the Zooms, it's a quick little message and they come out and help you. Okay, so God, welcome Chris. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the uh, kind intro. Um, nice to see everybody. Nice to see uh, loads of smiling faces. Uh, probably had long days sat at laptops or iPads doing schoolwork. So nice to see you're all still smiling. Um, like I say, you know, thanks for, to Paul for uh, inviting me on. Um, he just asked me to come on and, and, and speak to you in terms of not goalkeeping because... In fairness, I ain't got a clue about goalkeepers other than they're all uh, usually, in my experience, they're all usually mad goalkeepers. Um, so I'm sure we've got a few budding young goalkeepers on here and I'm sure you're not all mad, but uh, if you're going to develop into a good goalkeeper, <laughs> I think you'll probably uh, end up going that way. But um, hey, I, I don't know where you're all based, um, but just to give you a little introduction into into me um i'm from an area called peniston um i grew up in uh, in peniston and i still live uh sort of 10 minutes from peniston i live in a village called thurgland um so i've basically stayed not far from where i grew up as um as a young lad uh i went to peniston st john's junior school and then obviously up to uh, peniston grammar school and that's really where you know certainly at Peniston St John's that's where my football journey began really uh, playing for playing for the school teams and also going down to Peniston Sports Centre um, you're all too young to know a guy called Barry Murphy uh, but there is uh, 
an absolute Barnsley football club legend called Barry Murphy. He used to run uh, coaching sessions, a bit like probably what Paul does now. He used to do coaching sessions for all us on a on a Saturday morning at Penniston Sports Centre. And I think I was, you know, seven or eight when when I started playing uh, football down there, playing for the school team. Um, and then through playing for the school team, uh, I ended up having some trials for uh, a team called Hoyland Common Falcons. Uh, I think they, I think they're still going, and possibly some of you might play against them. I know there's different. I think there's Oil and Magpies as well now. But um, I started playing for Oil and Common Falcons when I was nine. The age groups only started at under eleven. Now, I mean, a lot of you, you know, you're lucky. Your football journey starts under under sixes, under sevens. I think. Uh, whereas I was an under nine playing in uh, under elevens. Uh, but I think often people look at ex-professional footballers and think that their journey has been quite easy and everything's, you know, just, just started and carried on and going up. I was, I was actually my first trial sessions for Hoyland Common Falcons. I was refused. Um, like I said, I was, I was a bit younger, uh, but they said I weren't good enough. Um, and my auntie, she lived across the road from where we had the trials, uh, in Ireland, and I remember, and I'm not too ashamed to say, and I went home, uh, well, I went to my auntie's, and I sat in my auntie's living room and actually cried because I'd, I'd been refused. I was absolutely gutted, you know, and that's that was my first bit of real refusal um, in, in football, you know. So uh, I dusted myself down, went back, carried on doing the things at the Sports Centre with Barry Murphy and went back the year after for the trials with Oil and Falcons and the year after I got in. And um, so that's when my journey started playing with, with teams in football. Uh, uh, still playing for the school team uh, up at St John's, uh, playing for Oil and Common Falcons. And then at that stage, we started getting picked up for the Barnsley Schools FA as well. So the, the Barnsley boys. Uh, you know, some of you live in Sheffield, you know, like Sheffield boys, you probably play against Barnsley boys. Um, you know, so it was, um, it was Barnsley boys on a Saturday and then Oil and Common Falcons on a, uh, on a, on a Sunday afternoon. That was like the, uh, the Sheffield League. Uh, and then obviously you get playing for your junior teams. And as you start getting a bit older into 11, 12, and then 13, you know, I started doing trials for, for professional clubs, uh, I was heavily involved at Barnsley Football Club uh, from being being 11. But I also had trials at uh, Nottingham Forest, at Leeds. And unfortunately, uh, I've got to admit to this, but this stays on this conversation. I actually once pulled on the blue and white stripes of Sheffield Wednesday to have a trial at Wednesday. And unfortunately for Wednesday, they also said I weren't good enough either. Um so I never, uh, never, never went back to Middlewood Road for another trial. Uh, so again, just just carried on, and then um, obviously when I was when I was uh, at, at the grammar school, the decision then was, um, you know, where where we wanted to sign as um, as schoolboys. Um, I actually signed for uh, for Barnsley instead of Leeds United. And again, you're all too young, but if you, your dads might be sat in the background. My decision to sign for Barnsley uh, was alongside a, a decision whether I should sign for Barnsley or Leeds. And at the time, Leeds United had just won the equivalent to the Premier League. And so, they, you know, they, they were a brilliant team. It was the old first division, but the equivalent now to, to what you know as the Premier League. And Barnsley were in the championship and Barnsley were always a team that were near the bottom of the league. But... Barnsley had at that time probably five or six homegrown players that had come through their system into the first team. And I remember leaving Allen Road and I wanted to sign for Leeds. And my dad said to me in the car driving home, he said, just, just think about where you want to go. He said, Leeds is great. And he said, obviously, you get your free tracksuit and you get all your kit and your T-shirts and your boot bags, which obviously when you're young is a massive attraction. Um, but I remember my dad saying to me, and it was probably one of the best bits of advice ever, just saying, look at where your opportunity might be. And he was right. Barnsley had five or six players in the first team. Um, so I, I made the decision to sign for Barnsley um, as a schoolboy. 
and then obviously upon leaving Penistone Grammar School, uh, going as a, a as an apprentice. You know, you, nowadays you call it scholarships. You know, a lot of your different ages, you'll be you'll be working towards um, you know possible decisions on scholarships. So ours was an apprenticeship. So when I left school, I went straight to Barnsley Football Club, uh, did a two year apprenticeship. Uh, obviously playing for the under 18s the youth team uh eventually then progressing into the reserve team and you know i was i was lucky when i was young i was um i was always seen as being uh you know sort of of a captain as a leader i was lucky to captain barnsley under 18s barnsley football club that went into the reserves um captain the reserves as well and then obviously when you're in re- in the reserves and you're doing well you you then try and push on to um to the to the first team and you know my chance came at Barnsley Football Club in the first team as as a 20 year old so obviously I left school at 15 16 you've got that period then in between where you've got to work your way through you know the youth team the reserve team and you know I was luckily to be uh, selected to play for Barnsley's first team at, I was just 20. Uh, I was 20 in the November as I made my debut in January. And that was when Barnsley were in the Premier League. And unfortunately, my debut away at West Ham, always a d- game that never forget, never forget your debut. We got beat 6-0. So a fantastic introduction into first team football, a 6-0 defeat. Uh, so when you, when you talk about taking hits as a young man and learning and learning the ups and downs of, of football. Uh, that was my first taste of, uh, of professional football, but obviously football goes on. You have to get on, you have to deal with things. And, you know, I, I worked my way into the team. Uh, I think I played, I'm never very good with, uh, with remembering games. I think I played with Barnsley. Luckily, like for us, the end of that season, we got relegated out of the Premier League. Uh, we went back to the Championship. The manager then, Danny Wilson, he left to go across from Barnsley to Sheffield Wednesday to be uh, Sheffield Wednesday manager. And at Barnsley, we got a new manager. We got a fellow called John Hendry, who'd been an absolute you know, legend, really, as a player. Uh, he took over as manager and... Unfortunately, again, ups and downs of football. He he didn't fancy me one bit as a player. Uh, so we started the season after. So as a young man at 20 years of age, I was looking forward to pre-season, going back and, and trying to be in the first team. And he just didn't fancy me at all. Uh, and I learned years and years after that he actually tried selling me to Mansfield Town, um, who were in League, League Two at the time. He tried selling me to Mansfield Town for £50,000. And a lot of paper talk the year before when I was in the playing in the Premier League, Liverpool were trying to sign me for four million pounds. Newcastle were trying to sign me, and then this new manager tried selling me to Mansfield for fifty thousand pounds. So unfortunately for uh, John, not just not just that he was trying to sell me, but results weren't good. And unfortunately for John, he he got the sack. And and again, you're all too young to remember this name. Some of you might know the Sheffield United fans. Uh, a man called Dave Bassett. Uh, Dave Bassett had been a huge, huge uh, hit at Sheffield United. You know, up there with Neil Warnock as one of the best managers, and also obviously Chris Wilder. Now, um, you know, they'll probably go down as the three best managers in Sheffield United history. But Dave, Dave Bassett came to Barnsley, uh, and he 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 put me back in the team. Uh, I worked my way back in. He uh, he picked me and. At the end of that season, we ended up getting to the playoff final at Wembley. Uh, fantastic day out at Wembley, you know, families. Um, the old Wembley Stadium, it used to be an uphill tunnel. Uh, the new ones now, you always come out at pitch level. But this one was uphill. And obviously, we played Ipswich Town. They played in blue and white. Barnsley, obviously, red and white. And still now, when I'm talking to you lot, I can feel airs on the back of my neck standing up. When we got to the top of the tunnel at Wembley, half the stadium was red and white and the other half was blue and white. It was just an unbelievable sea of colour and noise. And that's probably one of the games, you know, when I look back.
my career that I remember on the football. We ended up getting beat in that game. Horrible place to lose a game of football, Wembley. You've probably got 35,000 people all cheering because they've won and then 35,000 people all crying into the beer or the bottle of Coke or whatever they, they drink. And absolutely, the other half is gutted. Um, so, you know, flick on a little bit. Obviously, um, we didn't we didn't go up with Barnsley. Then um, there was a lot of uh, a lot of players left the club. Um, Changes a manager again, and uh, Barnsley Football Club hit a bit of a bad period, really. And the club went into administration. It was losing a lot of uh, a lot of money, and they decided uh, that was a time to start selling players. And that was two thousand and three, when uh, the opportunity for me came to leave Barnsley and sign for Sheffield United. So, as you can all imagine, you know, if, if, if you've been at a club for a long time, you know, it's, it's hard. And I'd been at Barnsley from, well, like I said, originally from 11 years of old, 11 years of age, sorry, but, you know, in a, at a, in a professional um, place from 16 leaving school to 25. So it was, it was a real hard decision for me to leave Barnsley because, you know, Barnsley was... You know my, my club. You know I'd been there most of me, uh, most of me, uh, my young life. Uh, but the opportunity came to, to move to Sheffield United, who had had a fantastic year that year. They got to two semi-finals of the cup, a playoff final, and Neil Warnock had tried a couple of times to sign me. You know, so um, Sheffield Barnsley made the decision. They had to, to sell players to get some money in. And, uh, you know, so I flew the nest, uh, went across from Barnsley to Sheffield United. And then that's that's when my, you know, Sheffield United journey uh, journey started. Um, you know, some fantastic times at Sheffield United, you know, um, uh, promotion to the Premier League, leading the club as a as a as a, as a captain, a uh, couple of near misses on getting in the playoffs and and, and, and losing at Wembley to Burnley and things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, a, a great experience at Sheffield United and probably the pinnacle of that to, as, a, as a captain, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to, lead, to lead the club to promotion to the Premier League was, was certainly a highlight. Uh, but unfortunately, similar, similar situation as we found at Barnsley. One year in, we were relegated out. Uh, and went back to the champ, went back to the championship. So, obviously, my career went through. Uh, I'm, I'm fast forwarding a bit because I, I don't want to take too much time up because I know you'll have loads of questions. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of, of, of insight. Uh, so, my my career came to a little bit, well, an end really. Playing uh, at 33, I got a I got a bad knee injury uh, playing against Coventry at home. Uh, I, uh, I ruptured three ligaments in my knee. Didn't know I'd done it at the time. Uh, did it just before half time. Played the whole second half. Didn't think anything was wrong with my knee. Just felt really loose. Um, physio told me after the game that he weren't particularly happy with the swelling on my knee. Went for a scan the next morning and the scan revealed that I'd ruptured three ligaments in my knee. So went for an operation. Actually had the operation on my birthday. So that was a lovely birthday present to have a, a knee reconstruction uh, in hospital in London on my own. Uh, and unfortunately for me, I, that, that, that was my last game, the Coventry game at Bramall Lane, because I, I, I never got back from that knee injury. Um, they told me at the time when I'd, I'd done it that it was career threatening. I, with the type of person and the type of player I was, I didn't believe the physio, I didn't believe the doctors, I didn't believe the surgeon. Um, tried everything nearly two years uh, in rehabilitation, trying to get back, um, but I, I, I just couldn't get back. I just got too much swelling on on the knee, so I made the decision then that I had to retire. So obviously, any professional footballer, what do you do when you get to uh, retirement age? So it was a natural thing for me to go into coaching. I'd started doing my coaching badges, um, so I started working with the first team and the under twenty three team with the younger players. Um, Coached, coached that under-23 team while, while working with um, the first team manager, Danny Wilson, uh, who obviously the ones who were listening earlier, he was the one actually that gave me my debut as a player as well uh, at Barnsley. So he then brought me into, uh, into coaching. 
Uh, and then the coaching at Sheffield United, I worked for three, two, three, four different managers. Uh, did a caretaker stint twice. So the caretaker means when a manager gets a sack, I got the opportunity to look after the players for a, for a, for a short space of time. Uh, the first time I actually interviewed for the job, I wanted the Sheffield United manager's job, but the, uh, the chairman and the board decided that they thought somebody else was, was better suited. Uh, which I was absolutely gutted at because because I wanted obviously playing for the club and captain in the club. I wanted to have a chance to be a manager as well, uh, but they they changed the mind. So then you know obviously a bit of time went along and I thought right I need to I need to come out of Sheffield United. I need to go and stand on my own two feet. And if I want to be a manager, um, you know I've got to start doing things for myself. So I left Sheffield United to go to Chesterfield. Uh, Again, with Danny Wilson. Danny obviously played a, played a big part in, in my career. Debut as a player, debut as a coach, and then uh, at Chesterfield as assistant manager. We, uh, we did a year, a year there uh, in charge at Chesterfield. Uh, nice people as they are in football. I got sack on my wife's birthday. I was taking her out that night. We were supposed to be going out for a nice, uh, nice birthday meal. And I got the sack after the game away at Bradford City. So you can imagine... My wife was really happy when I got home, face like thunder, <laughs> not happy at all. But hey, football's football and you, you you lot are all really young and football's really important to you. But what you will realise is, is that football's important, but, you know, you, your, your family is more important. You know, at your stage now, you're, you know, it's your brothers, your sisters, your mums, your dads. Football's great, but they're, they're <laughs> important. So for me... At that stage of my life, 38, 39, it was my wife, my children. Uh, so I'd been this, I'd been sacked that afternoon, but I still went out, took my wife out. You've got to, got to keep her smiling because if, if your wife's not smiling, as, as your dads will tell you, if your wife's not smiling, then he's not smiling. Um, so after Chesterfield, I went to Port Vale. Uh, Michael Brown, again, the Sheffield United supporters all know Michael Brown. Michael was caretaker manager. I went across to Port Vale as assistant manager to help Michael for a bit. Um, I think we did from March to uh, March to the October. So only a real short stint. And when I left Port Vale, I then went into this job that I'm doing now. Um, so uh, I, now, I now work for a, a football agency. So we look after football players. It's the agency that looked after me when I played. Uh, a company called Stella, and I've been now working for a football agency for three years. Hence, why I need to go to the game tonight because we've um, we look after three three of the Barnsley players: uh, Coley Woodrow, Connor Chaplin, and um, Carlton Morris. And we've also got lads at Chelsea as well. Um, people like Mason Mount, uh, obviously Ruben Loftus Cheek. Obviously, Ruben's not there because he's at. Um, He's at Fulham on loan, so I'm going tonight to watch watch uh, watch some of these players. So I should really be sat in the house watching it with fire on and a cup of tea, but no, I've been daft and I'm going to put my hat on, my big coat, and I'm going to go and sit in the coldest stand in the world at Oakwell, and that is actually I don't know whether any of you have ever been to watch a game at Barnsley Football Club, but that old wooden stand is the coldest place on earth. I promise you. So I'll have my long johns on, all layers, at gloves. So if it pans on the camera, if you're watching the game later on and it goes up into the uh, stand and you see somebody with a bobble hat on and his mask, obviously, because of COVID, that will be me. So I hope I haven't bored you there. I hope you're all not falling asleep. Uh, Paul's, fa Paul's falling asleep because he's heard that story a million times before. So uh, I was just, I was probably nudging him. You could see that I was giving him a, a virtual nudge to keep him awake. Um, but yeah, so that was basically me from probably the age that you're at now to being an old git at 43. That's been my football journey. So I'm sure you've got hundreds of questions and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering them. I'll answer them as honestly and as, as straight as I can. Uh, and honestly, if you've got any questions, I, ask it, please. Because again, use the, use this one, and 
and you'll 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 always be sat in class, I'm guessing. And I got I got told when I was doing my coaching badges that sometimes you think a question's daft, but you know what the the daftest question is? The one that you never ask. So even if you think it's daft, ask it because it it, it never will be, because you'll always get the answer probably that you want. All right. That's what so, I'll, I'll start them off, Chris, because I'll probably answer the ask the daftest questions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so so mainly for so what I want to know is and what, what we can learn is from a censored ass point of view, obviously I had you screaming at me for for a bit and you had me screaming at you as well. So from a censored ass point of view, what, what do you want behind you? What do you expect the goalkeeper to do when they stood behind you in a game? First and foremost, be vocal because he 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 can be your he can be your eyes, he can be your ears, you know, as a defender. The goalkeeper can see, you know, you're you're watching everything that's going on in front of you as a defender, but obviously you've got them a goalkeeper behind you. So that communication from a goalkeeper is is paramount. It's it's so important, you know. It's it's start positions in relation to the back four. You know, you see some goalkeepers that are rooted to their line. They don't want to come off, you know. So a ball will go over the top of the defender's head. And he's expecting his goalkeeper to be there to tidy it up. And he's not, he's on his line. But, you know, if you've got a goalkeeper that's vocal and has got good start positions, then, you know, it makes it so easy, so easy for defenders. The the best, the, 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 other than Paul, the best goalkeeper I ever played with was Paddy Kenny at, uh, at Sheffield United. And people who ever watched us thought that me and Paddy hated each other because the amount of times on a match day that we used to be arguing and nose to nose, like arguing with each other and pushing each but it's because we had such big demands on each other, you know? Um, I think it but, proves how influential Paddy is that Niels took him to Middlesbrough. Because obviously yeah. Paddy, Paddy at his age and he's been out of the game a little bit, just his knowledge and having him there and as a vocal goalkeeper, is he, want, is, he, want him, he wants him at the club to be able to bring the other ones on. Yeah. And, and the thing is with um, with managers like Neil, they always want people they can trust. You know, people who they've worked with before. Uh, and obviously, Paddy Paddy played for him at, uh, at at Bury at Sheffield United. Then he took him to Leeds, uh, QPR. So yeah, it don't it doesn't surprise me one bit that um, that that Neil's took Paddy into uh, into Middlesbrough as well. And you know, the character Paddy is, it'll it'll be great for them goalkeepers. You know, it'll be uh, it'll be brilliant. And, and you know what? Sometimes as well, it's not it's not just the technical element of the coaching drills. It's it's the information. It's the it's the camaraderie. You know, it's yeah. it's it's like what you get with it's what you get with Paul. If if you turn up to your training sessions and it's dull and it's and and you don't have fun, then as 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 young young lads young girls you, you're not going to go back to the sessions and it's only it's only the same for first team players they need to go and enjoy the session they need to have fun and you know the best managers and coaches i played for you you, you had fun you know you had fun but when it was work time you know you listen and you concentrate but you can also have fun as well while 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 you're having your coaching sessions okay good brilliant so from there then so we're going then into uh as a coach. So we talk about a, a lot about the information, what the goalkeepers get from the sidelines, from the coaches and the coaches actually seeing the game from a different angle as what they actually do in the game. So when you're getting told you should be coming for the cross, if you're getting told you should be coming for the through ball, obviously as a goalkeeper, you'll see it on a front on angle and the coaches see it from a side and angle at the side of the pitch. So from a coach's point of view, what, what do you look for in your goalkeepers there as well? I, I, I actually made the vow that I think this two this that I'd try and help and offer advice, but I'd think both of their positions are the, They obviously coaching helps, but good goalkeepers 
a good, they, you know, they, they know where they need to stand in the penalty area. They know when they need to come for crosses. You know, they, they, they are vocal. It's like centre forwards, you know, as an ex, as an ex centre. What used to, what used to bother me, what, what runs and what centre forwards did that gave me problems, you know, but I never tried to coach a centre forward on when to make runs, how to make runs, because I, I weren't a centre forward. So it was it was similar with goalkeeping, you know, and um, and and I think you're right, Paul. When you're watching when you're watching game from the sideline, the distances look different. You know, the speed of the ball. You know, when you're out there actually making the decisions when you're playing, you know, you have to make split decisions. You know, very very quick decisions. And often a goalkeeper will come for a ball, and it's like, oh, he shouldn't have come. He should have stayed at home, or you know, he should have come there. And you know. I used to try and talk to the goalkeepers and get a bit of an insight onto what they were thinking. But one thing I never, ever tried to do was tell the goalkeeper how to do his job because I, I think it's such a specialised position. I really do. Yeah, but I mean, a good example. I mean, if we can remember what a football game was like when it was full of, full of the crowd. When, when, yeah. a shot, when, a, when was a shot on goal and it missed, half the crowd jump up and think it's gone in and and half the crowd don't and some of them realize it's missed by 10 foot and some of them think it's just missed so it's it's just the different angles that you can see the games at isn't it it is yeah it depends it depends where you're sat in the stadium you know yeah. so it's right you know a, a manager and a coach will I'll, I'll, I'll stand watching a game and you know hey goalkeepers goalkeepers and center backs will always get the blame when whenever a goal goes in they will always get the blame but i used to argue like mad we we are managers because Often goals occur when centre forwards give the ball away, or they're lazy and they don't track a runner, you know, or it's a bad pass and it gets intercepted, you know, and then all of a sudden the game's wide open. And as as defenders and goalkeepers, you're the last line of defence. Obviously, it's your job to keep the ball out of the net. But often goals come from centre forwards' mistakes. That's what I always used to say. Anyway, I, I agree with you. <laughs> so on, it's on true. Through. Yeah. On, on to your current role then. So obviously now with your current role, looking after lots of young players and goalkeepers, obviously we had uh, Jack who come with us who, who uh, we helped in the summer. Yep. Um, what what are the clubs asking from you for the goalkeepers? What are they looking for in the current goalkeepers at the minute? What what do they expect? Um, clubs, whatever age with goalkeepers, Clubs always want big goalkeepers. That's the first thing they ask for. When when you say you've got a goalkeeper, they say, how tall is he? Yeah. Clubs now are getting obsessed with playing out from the back. Or if they're not playing out from the back, you know, you get teams a little bit lower down or even, you know, without being rude to Burnley, we look after Nick Pope, the Burnley goalkeeper. Sean Dyche has not bothered one bit whether he can play a one-two with his centre-back in the 18-yard box because Burnley don't play like that. But Sean Dyche wants to know that Nick Pope can drop it on his centre centre forward's head, eighty yards away. So, what's his distribution like? So the f- the first questions are how big is he? What's his distribution like? But let's not forget the main question about goalkeepers and when you're doing through going through stats, how many clean sheets has he kept? Does he keep the ball out of the net? But but usually the first the, the first questions are uh, how big is he and what's he like with his feet. So, you know, you get you get goalkeepers who are asked, you know, to, to be really comfortable. You know, people like Alisson at Liverpool, probably bad bad choice there. You know, he, he made two mistakes last week. But other than that, he's been absolutely outstanding. And he's he's as good as uh, any outfield player, you know, with with his feet. Um, but yeah, clubs, you know, whether it's whether it's 16 year old goalkeepers that are coming in as scholars or senior goalkeepers that we've got. Everybody wants to know, are they good with the feet? You know, so uh, a lot of goalkeepers now that we have, um, Jack Jack Hall, who um, Paul just mentioned there, is a young goalkeeper who I look after at Sheffield Wednesday. And Jack Jack will take his gloves off on a Tuesday and Thursday night when they do their under-16 training. And he'll go and join keep ball sessions to get better, better with his feet. You know, so he'll not necessarily do the goalkeeping drills. He'll go and play with the outfield players because he wants to get, um, you know, a better touch, better distribution, um, you know. But obviously, again, you know, the, the important thing about a goalkeeper is, is can you make saves at vital times? You know, that, that will always be the most important 
judgment on a goalkeeper. Does he make saves? It's, it's, it's how the game's changing as well, though, isn't it? I mean, you think about... I mean, I, I'm, I can only use my right foot, so I only ever had to use my right foot. And one, one of the pluses of my game is that I could find that player at the end of the pitch. But obviously, passing it out the back, we, we never did it. So it, it was something that we never worked on. And, and the things that we try and instill now with the students is that the game has changed. A lot, a lot of the time with the grassroots managers, they still play how we played 20 years ago. And they still instill, they still want it kicking long. But even though their manager wants them to kick it long, for them going forward and developing, they still need to work on the short game. They still need to work on the feet. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, hey, because so, some, some of you might think you want to be a goalkeeper now. Um, I remember when one of my fir first games for Oil and Common Falcons, going back to when I was 11, 12, um, I played in the goals. You know, they didn't have a goalkeeper and it was like, yeah, I'll go in. And I'll be honest, I absolutely hated it. I, you know, I, I didn't like it one bit because I wanted to be involved. And, you know, some of you now are starting your football journey. You you, you might love being a goalkeeper, you know, and you, you, you might change your mind. You know, you might be a goalkeeper all the way through your career, you know, where, wherever wherever your footballing career, you know, ends up being, you know, you, you might be a goalkeeper all the way through or you might change. You know, so if if you are developing techniques with your feet and being able to play, you know, if you change your mind and you want to be an outfield player, then that, that becomes easier. Okay, God, so there's a few questions on the chat. We'll we'll just uh, ask them first and then we'll open it up to everyone else. So Ryan's asked, uh, what do you think to VAR? Um, I think it's actually, without being too political, I think it's spoiling the game. Um we see now goals being disallowed for, you know, your, your finger end is offside or your toe, you, you know, your toe is offside. Fo football has always been about scoring goals, you know. So I just think, you know, if 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 you're offside, you're offside. But we can't we can't be going to the minutest details, you know, or you know, players are players are tr trying to block shots in a penalty area. You know, I, I know for a fact, because we've got some players at Man City, I know that Pep Guardiola tells his players, Raheem Sterling, Gabriel Jesus, whoever it is, when they get in the penalty area, if they go down a dark alley and they can't get through, you, you watch the Man City players, they'll flick the ball, they'll flick the ball in the air towards the defenders. And Pep Guardiola tells their, their attackers to chip the ball at the defenders' arms. And if it hits them, and he says it's not cheating, make the referee make a decision. And I think if that's modern football, then we should stop it and just just not just just close the doors on the stadiums because that is absolute madness. You know, if, if we're going to get penalties for somebody chipping the ball at somebody's hand, you know. Um, it, for me, it was, I think it was brought in for the bigger decisions. You know, I know we've got goal line technology, um, but for me, it was, the, the penalties that the referee might not be able to see properly, you know, or, or it, you know, it's hit the crossbar and come down. It, is it in? Is it not in? For the, for the bigger decisions, you know, I, I think we, you know, referees now, and I feel for referees because they want to do a good job, but referees in many ways have been made to look daft because they're not allowed to make a decision. You know, they, they, end, they have to look at a screen or they have to wait for two, three minutes for a message to come on his on his on his earphones, and you know, I I just think we need to simplify VAR and use it use it for the big decisions. Let's let's use it for the decisions that it was brought in to make. I think if you look at the Sheffield United goal last night for the penalty decision, I don't that no one had seen that if it if it were in real play, would they? That had to be no. slowed down, and and they're they're probably the decisions that probably do get missed, especially at grassroots level. It had. It would have never been seen, would it? So, yeah. Well, you can see it in the FA Cup. Obviously, we're in FA Cup week, and some of the stadiums who don't use VAR, you know, the, the Championship and things, you know, that there'll be decisions in the FA Cup that should have been penalties, and they're not because the stadiums don't use VAR. Um, so you've got one competition using two sets of rules, and it becomes a little bit unfair. It does, yeah, I agree. So we'll start. We'll start on up to the students then. See what fun questions they've got to ask. So. Go on then, Freddie. We'll get we'll get you up first, Freddie. As soon as you've got your Wednesday top on. 
Thank you for speaking tonight. My dad says you often commit a foul on set pieces. How do you think you would get on with VAR if you played now? Oh, Freddie, thank you for your question and thanks for being really polite. Uh, your dad must have never seen me play. I never gave any fouls away. Never. He You're must have been thinking... He must have been thinking of somebody else. You want it record holder for more sending offs, aren't you? It's shifting out of doubt. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Paul. You noticed I didn't put that information that I gave to the students. I didn't want them to know that. <laughs> so I, Paul, Paul touched on it earlier on. The, the, the game has changed massively, and you, you'll hear now it, it's 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 described in football as being good at the dark arts and you used to be able to hold people or pull people or stand on the toes when they were wanting to run away so they couldn't run and things. And a hey, defenders used to be, you know, if, if, if you want to look at proper defenders, look at Italian defenders, they used to get away with murder. They used to do all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, you, you can't do things now. You know, you, you can't hold on to somebody's shirt. You can't block, you know, it's, it, VAR picks everything up and you know so I think that's why we see now a lot more zonal marking rather than man-to-man -man marking we we used to have to man-to-man -man mark because then if your man scored a goal it was your fault whereas now I think most of the teams they will zonal mark because you can't man-to-man -man mark because you risk giving penalties away Okay well we'll get Bradley up next because he's got a Sheffield United shirt on that's uh, older than me I think <laughs> Brian Dean and Tony Agana. Um, what what was the hardest striker that you've ever played against? The hardest striker I ever played against was Alan Shearer. Thank you. Alan Shearer, with, 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 with that, without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna come back, but just bear with me. Let me show you something. So I was I was lucky I was lucky enough. So that that's Alan Shearer's shirt on on the wall in my office, and that one's John Terry's as well. I was lucky enough to get both both England captains at the time, and when I, when I played against Alan Shearer the first time, I was um, I was only young, and Alan took his shirt off after the game and said to me, he said, Chris, he said. That's the first time I've ever played against you. He said, you're only a young lad. He said, but if you if you keep playing like you have done today, he said, you'll not do bad in the game, son. Uh, and I thought I was, and he took his shirt off and he, he gave me that. And obviously I, I brought it home, never even washed it, stuck it in a frame and I've had it ever since, ever since. And he, he for me, he was the ultimate centre forward. And pe people talk about pace and things like that. Alan was a lot quicker than people ever realised. But he was he was aggressive. He could head the ball. He could shoot with both feet. You know, he was tough. You know, he never let people get on top of him. Um, you know, and I was lucky enough to play against him twice. And uh, not only a top, top player, but he was an absolute gentleman after the game uh, as well. You know, for me being a young player, he was England captain at the time and how he took the time to speak to me after the game. And he, uh, when I went into the players' lounge after the game, I'll, I'll share this with you because it was something that stuck with me all the way through my career. And again, it goes back to when I talk about families being important. Obviously, he was the ultimate to the Newcastle fans and in the players' lounge, they used to invite fans into the lounge. Not not obviously hundreds, but there'd be 50 fans. So, obviously, he walked in the players' lounge. Everybody wanted to speak to Alan Shearer. And he walked in the lounge and he, he spoke to the supporters. They were all coming up and he weren't rude. He signed autographs. And to my left, I noticed two little girls and, and, and a lady. And as I, as I was listening, I realised that this was Alan's wife and his two daughters and Alan's wife left him for about 10, 15 minutes with the supporters. And then he, and then Alan's wife turned to one of his daughters and said, just go and get your dad. And she was, she must've only been five or six at the time. And she walked through all the bodies, all the supporters 
and she tugged on Alan Shearer's tracksuit bottoms and she said, Daddy, Mummy says, can you hurry up, please? And when, and when she said that to her dad, Alan said, Alan said to the supporters, he went, right, he said, lads, he said, it's time, family time now. And he said, that's, you know, thank you very much. And do you know what? The supporters left him and he came across and sat for the rest of the time with his, uh, with his wife and his two young daughters. Uh, and that's, uh, hey, an app, you know, a legend of English football and a legend, you know, obviously at Newcastle, Blackburn, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, so yeah, again, sorry for the long-winded uh, oh, answer, but Alan Shearer. We've got Addy Wade. Yes, Addy, when you're ready. Uh, so, I've got two. Who inspired you to play football? Who inspired me to play football? Um, I've got, I've got to say, my dad. My dad inspired me to play football um, because it was my dad who always took me down to the Penniston Recreation Ground or the Penniston Rec, as we used to call it. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it, the, the ground behind Tesco's. I'm sure you've all been dragged up to Tesco's in Penniston with your mum and dad if you, if you live in this area. Um, I used to go down there with my dad. He used to have a ball. Um, and, you know, my earliest memories of, of, of football were, were with my dad. Um, my dad played football, not professionally. He played, you know, local football. Um, but then obviously as, as I were growing up and you're all too young, you'll not know these people, but pe people for me, it was like t Tony Adams, who was um, England defender, Arsenal defender and captain, won loads and loads of league titles for Arsenal. He, he was somebody who I looked up to as a player. You know, again, um, I, was, I was lucky enough to, to, to captain the teams that I played for, but he, for me was like an ultimate leader, ultimate captain of, of his country and his club. So I've got two more. Go on, then, Who's your all-time favourite player? All-time favourite player? What? Who I played with or watched? In general. In general. Um, that's a good question, that. Do you know, do you know what? I, I don't think I've got an individual... Um, I, th I think it's again, it's pe growing up probably people like, um, you know, people like like Tony Adams, people like Brian Robson, who was um, Manchester United captain, England captain. I think pe people like them for me when I was growing up watching football, you know, for you now it's um, Ronaldo's and, and people, people like that. You know, we had we probably had people like Paul Gascoigne. And again, you're all probably going to look at me like thinking, "Who's Paul Gascoigne? Who's who, who's Tony Adams?" But then, then people for me, if you get chance to Google them, um, you know they were they were you know Paul Gascoigne in particular, fantastic talent who unfortunately lost his way in football again, got a nasty injury. But what a talented, talented player! Um, Man, so next next questions are for uh, Jensen Beaver. Um, what was it like uh, under Neil Warnock? Because uh, there's loads of videos on YouTube of, of him giving everyone like a proper hard time in the changing rooms. Um, yeah, do you know it, it, it was the it was the best part of my career without without a shadow of a doubt. You know, Neil Neil was the best manager I played for. Um, it was it it was a time when I probably played my best football, enjoyed uh, enjoyed my football. The, the most, but again, you know, I, I talk, I talk to current players and, and, and I don't think the dressing rooms are an area like they used to be, you know, um, we, we used to get massive demands on us. You know, we, you know, the, the, the clips you see, you know, the, um, the ranting, you know, the, 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 the swearing from the managers at the players with the demands, was you know was was madness you know it, it was and and I think football's changed now where you know I think obviously society's changed a little bit and and you you can't you can't speak to people the the way that we used to get sports to but you know it was it, it was how we'd grown up that was that was football for us you know and the the clips you see and um and the footage you see was was probably every other week we had that every other week 
you know, we it was players arguing with each other. Um, you know, I think a lot of players now, um, I think I think actually modern players are mollycoddled. I really do. I think they're given far too much. Um, I think they should stand on their own two feet. They should make their own decisions. You know, I think a lot of decision making, particularly young players, this is a bugbearer that I had when I was coaching. Uh, we used to have forums with the FA. Uh, you know, I, I think young footballers should be allowed to develop and I think they should be allowed to develop in, in game scenarios. And, you know, for me, I think football's become too technical. I think there's too many technical drills. And again, you know, this, this, this is my own, my own opinion. And, and please, you know, I'm not saying if, if you know, there's, there's, there's dads on here who might coach. Me as a young, a young player growing up, I learned playing five aside, six aside, eight aside, whatever it was, you know, 11 aside. That's, that's how I learned the game. And, and I just feel I watch a lot of academy coaches, a lot of grassroots coaches do too many drills. You know, I, I think kids become bored. I, I, I do. Um, and I, 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 I think the, the old days, and, and they are the old days, and, and, you know, football has changed. But, um, yeah, it, it, it was mad, you know, but Neil, Neil would have, have, he'd have a go at you after a game at half-time, but get on the coach or go back in for training Monday morning, everything was forgotten and, and we cracked on. You know, there was never, never any malice, never anything that um, was held against you. It was, for us, that was that was the time, that was football. Brilliant. Next one's uh, Jaden. Jaden Ironside. Hi, Christine, my cousin, Joe Ironside. I do know Joe Ironside. He he played he played for my under twenty three teams at uh, at Sheffield United. Uh, a big big strong centre forward who was do, doing very well at Cambridge, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Good player. Good player. Yeah. Um, very very um, devoted to wanting to be a professional footballer, and you know jo, Joe's a fine example of. Um, you know, players, when they come into systems, I think all players have the dream of playing for Real Madrid and playing for um, playing for Manchester United. Unfortunately, not everybody can do that, you know. But I think Joe's a fantastic example of players that come into a system and, and, and make a living in the game and actually enjoy being a professional footballer and having that privilege of... You know, Joe, same as me, leaving school, 16. You know, hopefully he plays on till he's 37, 38 um, and, and has, and has a, a real, real good career in football. But he, he will be one of the lucky ones that gets to the end and says, I've been, I've been lucky enough to have a, a career in football. And, you know, he's at Cambridge United. And that's, that, that's, that's great because he's, he's living, at, you know, all you lot on here dream of being a professional footballer. And I hope that some of you play at the absolute elite at the top, top level. It would be great for you, you know, um, but, but some of you, and unfortunately, you know, most of you won't because it's the, it's the lucky few that end up playing at the top, top level, you know, but if you can, if you can enjoy playing football and having a, having a career in the game, then, you know, you, you will be one of the lucky ones as well. But uh, yeah, Jaden, please, Please send him my regards. Tell him I were asking for him because um, he was uh, he was he was one of the players that I you know really really enjoyed working with. Cheers, Chris. No Thank problems. You. Thank you, Jaden. Very good, Zacho. You're up next, mate. Who was your favourite player at Sheffield United? Favourite player that I played with at Sheffield United. Yeah. I think I've got too many. I've got, I've got. To, I'm going to sit on the fence and say I've got, I've got far too many that I enjoyed playing with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was, I was lucky to have some great teammates, fantastic teammates. Um, you know, pe people like Paddy Kenny, people like Robert Page, people like Rob Coslook, Gary Naismith, 
and uh, Nick Montgomery, Phil Jagielka, Michael. T- <laughs> Phil, yeah, I played with Jag. Jag. Jag was obviously a lot younger at the time. Um, and I, hey, I, and by mentioning them names, I'm probably missing loads off as well. And I'm probably being, you know, rude to some people who, who have who have left off. But you know, I was I was lucky to, and and still I speak to a lot of them players um, who I've just mentioned, and we. We're still friends now, um, you know. So uh, prob- probably too many, too many to say that 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 one was one was more special than the other. Odd question, that fellow, isn't it? Thanks. Thank you. While you're on about Jags, what's what was it? What's it like as a keeper? Jags, Jags was Jags was great. He used to love he used to love going in goals after training, and Neil would have kittens because he always used to worry about him breaking his hand or doing something to get injured diving about in goals that would, that would, that would keep him out of a game on Saturday. Um, but yeah, he, he loved it. He loved it, and I think he still cherishes the kiss that I gave him that night when we beat Arsenal at Bramall Lane one nil, and. Uh, Paddy came off injured. Jags went in goal, and we we beat the mighty Arsenal one nil. Grace, you're up next. Uh, what what advice would you give to girls in football? Girls in football. Well, um, I get this every other day because my, my my daughter she's she's 15 and she she plays for Peniston Church, so she she loves football as well, and. You know, I, I think one thing I'd say to you is is that girls football is that the opportunities now that are available for girls to, to get involved in, you know, girls teams or mixed teams. You know, you see more and more girls playing with the lads. And I've, and I've got to say, Grace, when, when I watch her play and she's she's played from being 10, 11, when I, when I watch the girls play, they're actually tougher than the lads. And what they do, they go in and they tackle properly and they kick each other. And you know what? They don't moan. They pick each other up. And you see the lads sometimes, and the lads are the, the lads watch the the senior, the men too much. The lads roll about on the grass. You know what I mean? And the girls, they kick each other and they just smile. They just they just pick each other up and they get on. You know. So um, I I think if you're if you're a girl playing football, it. it doesn't matter whether it's a girls team a mixed team if you enjoy it grace you go out and play football you know because um it's it's a fantastic game to be involved in and honestly there's so many opportunities that are coming up for uh, for for girls in football now uh and not just playing you know to be involved in in staff you know you see physios uh where I'm going tonight to Barnsley two of the senior physios at Barnsley are girls um, you know they've they've got a nutritionist at Sheffield United who works with the first team. She makes sure that they're eating all the right stuff. So the levels that they perform at is not down to the players; it's down to her. You know she she basically tells them what to eat, when to eat. So there is there's loads of opportunities for 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 for, for girls and then women in football. So Grace, if, if you enjoy football. You you crack on and uh, and get involved in as much as you can. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. Alfie, you're up next. Alfie, husband. Um, what was your pre-match routine? Right. So I was I was quite superstitious. So um. When when I was when I was a senior player, I always used to try and do the same things. Um, so it involved, you know, when when I bought my, my my first house when I moved in with with me uh, with my fiance and then my wife, we we had two dogs. So my morning always used to start. I always used to take the dogs for a walk. I used to come back, and then I used to have pre match meal. Uh, that changed over the years because when I first, it was like chicken and beans with a bit of toast and then it was like jacket potatoes and you had to have spaghetti and you had to have you know pasta and but I sometimes I, I couldn't eat big meals you know I, I would if it was three o'clock kickoff you know we used to have to eat at 12 o'clock and I didn't like eating pasta and things like that 
So my, my routine used to revolve around walking the dogs in the morning, coming back, having like a big breakfast or, or a big lunch. Um, and then I always used to, I used to have a lucky pair of socks. So I used to keep the same socks. And if we won, I wouldn't wash the socks. So my wife would go mad, you know, I'd only have them on like traveling to the car and to the game, but they were my lucky socks. Um, and th- I once picked a pebble up on the drive. It had cut, we'd got like a little bit of a rockery on the drive and I picked a pebble up and I put it in my pocket, okay? It was in my tracksuit pocket going to the game. When I got to the game, we won the game. So I kept that pebble in my pocket as a lucky pebble. And it was the pebble was nothing to do with why we'd done the game, but sometimes you get that superstitious, you know? So, so I, I, I kept a pebble in my pocket I was a grown man with a pebble in my pocket. It was, it, it was daft. But a lot of players who you speak to have things like that, where the you know you you have a routine. Um, so uh, so yeah, it was walk in the morning, back breakfast, and then and I always used to if I drove a certain way to the game, whether it was to Oakwell at Barnsley or Bramall Lane, uh, obviously at Sheffield. If I drove a certain way to the game and we won. I'd drive, I'd drive the same way to the game the week after as well, until we lost, and then I'd try and find a different way. Brilliant. Well, I think we've just got two more questions. I'm just a bit wary that you do need to shoot off. So we'll, okay. just, we'll just get uh, Owen and Seb in. So, Owen, you're up, mate. Um, so, what would you say the best team is that you've played against? The best team I played against? I, to- I told this story to somebody the other night. Right. And I played against some brilliant teams that were that that were actual their first team players. OK, but we went to Arsenal one night with Sheffield United. Right. When they moved into the new Emirates Stadium. OK. And we got there and we'd gone full strength because it was like late on in the, in the cup. And when we got the team sheet through before the game, Arsenal had made loads of changes. They basically put all their young players in. And it was people like Carlos Vela, Jack Wilshire. They got some fantastic young players at, at the time. And we got the team sheet and we looked and we basically laughed at the team sheet. We said, oh, brilliant. They've put all the kids in. They beat us 6-0. I think it was 6, 5, 6. And we basically got our first team out. And I tell you, we couldn't... And honestly, I've ne- I never ever played in, the ga- in a game where I felt as though I couldn't influence what was going on other than that night. It was incredible. It was, it was a team of young players and it weren't even their first team. And it, it always sticks out in my memory that whatever we tried on the night, we, we just couldn't stop them. They, they were brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And a young Jack Wilshire nutmegs me on the halfway line. I think he was only 17 at the time. And he, he nutmegged me on the halfway line. And I was absolutely gutted. Okay, good. And I and I did and I did try kicking him, but I couldn't catch him. Oh, it was Seb. too quick. Seb, you're up next. Yeah, he's Steve, his dad. Hiya, Chris. Hi, Steve. Um, okay. Yeah, good. Thanks. Back in the Premier League, I had uh, George Ristoff for the back of my shirt. Yeah. My son Seb has seen it, and he keeps asking, "What was George Ristoff like?" So, can you tell us all? Bit random. <laughs> Georgie Ristoff. Uh, well, other other than his famous line of. Um, saying that Barnsley women weren't very good looking, uh, which, which I don't think was one of the best things that he could have said when he just joined the new club, uh, trying to make friends with the supporters. Uh, yeah, but jo- Georgie was a, he was, he was a young man that came from, came from, came from Macedonia. Um, he really, really struggled to, to settle, but what a, a fantastic young man, uh, I'm saying young man. He's, he was obviously a similar age to me when he first um, when he when he first signed, um, but a good player uh, that just just struggled to get to life in a foreign country. Um, he never really settled in Barnsley, and obviously, I just think he found it tough in the Premier League. He, yeah. he found it tough in the Premier League, and then even when we were relegated, I think he he, he struggled with with the football in the Championship and. You know, and and I think I'm not hundred percent sure, but if I was a betting man, uh, I don't think his career really went very far when he left Barnsley either. So, um, 
But, you know, a, 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 a fantastic young man who uh, I spent a lot of time with because he was a similar age, but, you know, st- struggled with, with the English language. You know, not just the English language, but struggled with the uh, yeah. with, with the Barnsley t- twang as well. He, he, he just struggled, bless him. But, um, you know, not, not through the one to try and. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Rich. Cheers. No, you're welcome. On the, on the back of his comment about Barnsley uh, women, he actually took my wife's uh, sister out on a date and they're identical sisters, twins. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he, was to- he was totally wrong then, weren't he, Paul? Yeah. Totally yeah. wrong. Yeah. He must have needed glasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Any any last few questions then before Chris needs to shoot? No, everybody happy? Score prediction for tonight. Ooh. Ooh. Well, I spoke to Coley early on, and I, I, I actually said to Coley, I fancy a bit of an upset tonight, you know. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know why. There's, there's not been many upsets, has there? And I don't know. I'm a, again... Traditionalist, a proper proper Yorkshireman. I just think Chelsea, all them superstars, they might make some changes. It'd be a cold night at Oakwell. Uh, Barnsley have been playing well, to be honest, of late. And I just I just think there might be a shock on the cards. I might go for uh, a Barnsley two one win. We've got Kepper in there, so anything could happen. <laughs> well, might be five one Barnsley then. Jake, Jake, have you got any questions about Port Vale? Now we've got we've got little Jake and his Jake. I'll, t- I'll I'll tell you one thing, Jake. Be- be- before I go off, I'll tell you one thing about what I don't miss about Port Vale: the drive across there every morning. I, I used to drive across every morning, and I, and what we did from like I said to you, we did from March to October, and I used to go through um, through Buxton and Leak up over the tops and. When we got sacked in October, my dad used to drive trucks. And when I rang my dad, when, when I came out of the office and told him that we'd been sacked, my dad's words to me were, you've been, you've been sacked just in time. And he said, because you wouldn't have got over them tops in winter when it was snowing. So uh, as your dads always fill you with uh, great information, that was my dad's words of wisdom. So it, my, dad, my dad was happy that I'd got sacked at Port Vale from my job because I couldn't travel over the tops in winter. You've got, got your excuse now, Jake, for his uh, managerial performances. Exactly. Have you got, have you got one more question, Jaden? There you go. Do you want to... No. Who's um, who's who's most funniest player you've ever come across? Like humorous. Uh, Rob uh, Rob Coslow at Sheffield United. With, oh, without yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. And, and unfortunately, most of his stories I can't share with the audience that we've got tonight. But um, if uh, if Paul were to organise a parent's one, I could honestly, some of the antics he used to get up to, um, he, was, he was brilliant, brilliant. Just things in the dressing room, things on the bus, things on the pitch, just a, a funny, funny, funny man. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, kids, not stories I can share with you. But uh, yeah, you know, a, a lad called Rob Kozlik, who I played with at Sheffield United. Okay, brilliant. So we'll just round it up so we can just let Chris get away because he is busy tonight. And then I'll just finish off the last five, ten minutes. So thanks a lot, Chris. Really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. You. Really you're appreciate welcome. you coming on tonight. And Bye. Cheers. Well, Keith, thanks. If everybody wants to thanks. give him a good round Bye. of applause. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks for inviting me on. Thank and you. Thanks, thanks for all your thanks for all your polite questions as well. Bye, thank you. Okay. Bye. See you later. Bye. 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 Thanks, Paul. If everyone else just stops on for a minute, we'll just round oh, it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. So I hope you enjoyed that. So the, the reason why I wanted to get someone on a little bit different tonight was for me, I get very frustrated that we listen a lot about people who play in different positions who try and tell us how to be a goalkeeper. So I think the best way for us to combat that is to learn about every other position as well. Okay, so if we can work on as goalkeeping, but we can also know what a centre-half's job is, 
what a midfielder's job is, what a striker's job is, what the coaches expect from us. Okay, like Chris said, we all we always stand at the back. We can always see all the game in front of us. We can help them out. We can give them good information. Okay, and that makes us a better goalkeeper and a better package. Okay, so good. So same again, I'm aware you've probably all been in front of your screens all day and you've all had enough and you all want to get on your Xboxes, Playstations, whatever. Okay, so if you're watching the game tonight, pay special attention to Jack Walton if he's playing. Okay, because Jack Walton's going to be joining us next week. Okay, so you can ask any questions about how we play tonight if he's playing. And then the week after that, we've got a young Sheffield Wednesday goalkeeper called Luke Jackson. And Luke Jackson used to attend my sessions. Okay, so I felt that was quite a good one to get on. Because obviously Luke, when he was all a lot younger than your ages, you attend your sessions like what you want. And then we can talk to him and see how we can how he progressed into where he is now. Okay, so well done. Thanks for joining me again. Keep up with your fitness stuff. All right, keep sending that through because it's really good to see you doing the extra stuff. Okay, and I'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.